Tak, tak. Trzeba z boku przesunąć na bok ekranu. Znaczy, chciałem tą łóżką pokazywać. A, okay. A, to, to nie, to Paweł będzie wierzył. Paweł jest ekspertem od Zooma wszelkich nowoczesnych technologii. W tym momencie my schodzimy i to będzie ta bateryjka się kończy. Okej, okay, okay, Paweł, czy my znamy baterię, żeby... Ja mogę skoczyć do recepcji i powiedzieć, że... Tak, tylko przyda też się, żebyśmy to tutaj wpięli, bo Dan akurat używał tego naszego centrowego laptopa. Nie, ten. No ja już skoczę do recepcji, bo jeszcze poproszę ich, żeby włączyć... Nie. Mhm. Tylko może nie na takie zimne, jak było to. Właśnie są, tylko nie na zimne. Ok, I'll try this mic. It seems to work. Let's, let's test it how long it will be to work. Because last time it would turn out faster. And this thing. This is more convenient because it's hands free. To możemy zaczynać. Paweł, ja wiem, czy nie cierpię do za chwilę. Czy chcesz poczekać? Dobra, dobra. Czyli poczekamy na. To mogę tylko pokazać. Pokazuje low battery. A, ty, ty szerujesz stąd. A, no to, no to nie ma całego. All right. Uh, welcome everyone to the second talk of the morning session. And our speaker is Pavel Zarczyk from the Gdańsk University of Technology, and he will speak about the topological method for computational analysis of the maps. Thank you. Uh, I would like first to thank the organizers for inviting me to this conference and for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Thank you also for coming. And I'm going to talk about uh, a long-term project that is uh, 
and uh, it's a, a complex method for uh, topological uh, computational analysis of dynamical systems. Uh, so the plan of the talk is the following. I'll begin uh, with some definitions uh, so that we uh, set up uh, the correct notation. I'm going to explain uh, certain topological invariants uh, that we use in this project. Or in other words, I'm going to take a bunch of definitions and throw them onto you. Uh, in the next part, I'm going to explain some technical details and the actual methodology that we use. And eventually, I'm going to show some uh, specific application of, of this method. So let's begin with the first part. Uh, just to uh, make sure we all talk about the same things, that we recall the, the formal definition of the dynamical system. So suppose we have a topological space. Uh, this is now this called a, an applied dynamical system because in general, uh, we take, uh, people tend to take a, a dynamical system as an action of a group on the space, and uh, this gets very general. Uh, we talk about something very uh, practical, and this is uh, we have a topological space, usually Rn or some part of Rn. Uh, then we have uh, a topological group for measuring time. This will be uh, the integers or the real numbers. And the notion of the dynamical system is the following uh, we have a specific rule uh, that uh, maps each point in the space uh, and to another point after some specific time. Uh, this rule does not change in time. Uh, so we have the following conditions. If we move after time zero, then the point of course does not move at all. And if we move the point at, uh, by time t and then the resulting point by time s, then it is equivalent to moving the initial point by the time t plus s. Uh, I'm going to talk about two kinds of dynamical systems, uh, uh, when we use the discrete time, then this will be a dynamical system typically induced by a continuous map uh, on the topological space. Uh, well, in the dynamical system, uh, we have the assumption of invertibility because we have the group. Uh, sometimes we, in practical applications, uh, like the dynamics of populations or some biological systems, uh, this map is not invertible. Uh, this is not a problem. Uh, the theory gets a little more uh, complicated. I mean, the definitions need to be more specific, but uh, essentially everything I'm going to talk about today works uh, in such a setting also. And in fact, uh, some of the examples I'm going to show uh, uh, correspond to semi-dynamical systems where the map is not invertible. Uh, another class of dynamical systems uh, that is very important uh, are continuous time dynamical systems. Uh, these are usually flows uh, that are induced by autonomous differential equations uh, and the trajectories or those uh, solutions uh, to, to the ODE uh, corresponds to the motion in the dynamical system. So a system of ODEs uh, introduced, uh, introduces a, a dynamical system. So some uh, assumptions are necessary, for example, that the trajectories don't uh, run escape to the infinity in finite time and things like that. Uh, but in the computations, I'm going to show if any trajectory escapes a certain bounded region, we just don't care about. It. So we can assume we have a continuous time dynamical system, at least in the region where uh, the dynamics is of our interest. Uh, so in general, uh, a dynamical system might look like this. So we have some trajectories. There is a hyperbolic fixed point. There is a bunch of uh, periodic orbits around some another fixed point. There is also another periodic orbit that is uh, that is repelling. There are, uh, there are some fixed points. In general, uh, the structures we are interested in are invariant sets. And we say that a set is invariant if it does not change upon the dynamics. For example, if we have a periodic trajectory, uh, the points move on the trajectory uh, with time, but the trajectory itself as a set does not change. Uh, if we take some other, uh, some larger set, uh, then we can define its invariant part 
as the largest uh, invariant set that is contained uh, in that set, the largest in terms of uh, inclusion. Uh, for example, inside this gray disk, uh, the, its invariant part is just uh, the fixed part because any other trajectory escapes from this disk either in forward or in backward time. Uh, we say that N is an isolated neighborhood if it is compact and its invariant part is contained in its interior. So we would like to get uh, some sort of isolation uh, for uh, those invariant sets so that we have some safety margin when we do uh, numerical computations. So we must uh, take into account some uh, round of errors, uh, some numerical errors. And this is why we need uh, to have this isolated, to, to have this uh, invariant set in the interior of this uh, neighbor. Uh, for example, uh, and here we can uh, define what, uh, what kind of invariant set is isolated. Uh, an invariant set is isolated if it, is, if it has an isolating neighborhood. If that is, it is the invariant part of some uh, isolating neighborhood. For example, this fixed point is an isolated invariant set. But if you look at this fixed point, it is not isolated because no matter how small neighborhood you have, there will always be some extra periodic trajectories included uh, in this neighborhood. However, if you take this large disk uh, shown in gray, then you see that uh, some tra trajectories that are uh, close to this yellow disk uh, run away from it. Uh, that's why this will be an isolating neighborhood. Uh, so now we would like to split the dynamics into recurrent parts, uh, which will consist of these isolated uh, invariant sets. And the remaining of the space uh, will be sort of simple dynamics that uh, runs from one set to another. Uh, specifically, I think uh, I'm thinking about uh, a gradient flow. So suppose we have a surface in R3, and everything moves, uh, all the points move downwards with the gradient. Uh, and in this situation, well, in the generic position, uh, we have a finite number of critical points, and all the other trajectories flow from one critical point to another. And so these are sort of uh, connections. Now, uh, Suppose we have a finite number of uh, these critical points, and we can depict this dynamics, this gradient dynamics, in a schematic way by means of a directed graph. Each node of the graph corresponds to one critical point. Uh, the information that we put in the node is the consecutive number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. I start numbering points from 0. Uh, in mathematics, people start numbering from one, which is neat. These are the natural numbers, but in computer science, the natural numbers begin with zero. Uh, so let's do this computer science way. Uh, and then I put the information about uh, the kind, the type of stability of each critical point, uh, which is uh, here the dimension of the unstable manifold, and this is called the Morse index. Uh, for a repeller, uh, the dimension of the unstable manifold is two, so I put the index two here. Uh, for a saddle point, uh, there's only one uh, repelling direction, uh, so the dimension of the unstable manifold is one, so the index is one here. And for an attractor, the index is zero. Uh, we would like to get the same kind of description of a general dynamical system, not necessarily uh, a gradient uh, dynamical system. But here the problem is that uh, we might have more sophisticated invariant sets, not just uh, fixed points, but also periodic orbits or some uh, invariant disks or even some more complicated uh, invariant sets like uh, topological horseshoes and things like that. It may transfer stability condition, but you don't have any gradient blue lines between the critical points with the same index. Well, I don't know. It could be the fact, but we are not interested in that. We are interested in uh, 
capturing all the critical points. But it, it does the same, but same mm -hmm. the fact that we don't have four lines to see the critical points with the same index. If you add that assumption, we yes, but, but we want to know uh, what kind of transitions are possible between the critical points. This is the, the key here. So we don't want to make to make this any simpler than that. Uh, it is necessary to reduce the global information about the dynamical system, but not too much, so that we still retain the information that is interesting. Uh, so here, I, on, on purpose, I keep uh, the information about the possible trajectories between those saddle points. Uh, and in fact, I didn't plot the trajectory, the connection between the, this repeller and this attractor. Uh, because then we would get a lot of arrows in the graph. Uh, let's think about this graph as a transitive reduction. So any path in the graph corresponds to a possible trajectory in the dynamical system. Yeah, that, that is answer to gradient. Yes, so this is a gradient dynamical system. And this, can, this situation can be generalized uh, to a general dynamical system where we also have some other invariant sets, not just critical points. Uh, and this is called uh, a Morse decomposition. It was introduced uh, by Conley in the 70s. Uh, a Morse decomposition is a finite collection of disjoint isolated invariant sets, uh, such that uh, we have a partial order on these sets. A partial order is defined by the dynamic. In other words, uh, there could be trajectories uh, joining uh, different invariant, isolated invariant sets, but uh, we don't allow to have loops in these connections. Uh, if we squeeze these isolated invariant sets into uh, nodes of a graph, we can depict this more decompositions by means of a directed graph again, and we can move the point the, those nodes up and down to mimic the gradient uh, situation. And because of this assumption on the partial ordering, uh, we don't have loops in this graph. Uh, and this is the kind of uh, description of dynamics that uh, we are looking for. And we would like to have this computed automatically. So we get a dynamical system, run the computations, and we get the graph. And well, OK, so this is the information about the dynamics uh, outside uh, the uh, isolated environment set. Because everything that was in the isolated environment set was just squeezed to a single point. We would, get, we would like to uh, also have some information, at least about the stability type of those isolated environment sets. That's why we had the Morse index. And a generalization of the Morse index is the Conley index that was uh, introduced uh, by Conley in the 70s. And he initially called this Morse index, but now we call it Conley index. Uh, let me explain in uh, some of more details uh, this topological invariant of dynamics. Suppose we have a saddle fixed point like this. So the trajectories on, on one direction approach this point. Uh, all the other directions uh, dismiss the point or go outside the uh, vicinity. And the definition of the common index is uh, based on the notion of uh, an index pair. Uh, the index pair, like an example here, consists of uh, two sets. Uh, the larger set, this is the union of uh, the blue and red in this picture, uh, it's called P1. And the smaller set is uh, usually denoted P2 or P0 in some cases. And this subset captures uh, the part of the larger set to which the trajectories leave. Uh, the isolating neighborhood that is inside. So we have the following three conditions. Uh, let me begin with the third one because this is probably the most tricky one. Uh, this blue part inside must be an isolating neighborhood so that the invariant part is contained in its interior. So there is no invariant uh, set that touches the boundary of this blue set. And uh, then we have uh, these two conditions, I'm not going to read the formulas, I'm going to explain them uh, on using the picture. Uh, so first of all, if there is a point in the blue part, and after some time we know that it is outside, uh, it leaves uh, this uh, isolating neighborhood, then it must go through P2. And this is the first condition saying that 
its trajectory is inside one, and at some point we get to this exit set. The second condition says that if we if there is a point in the exit set, that then it cannot get back into the isolated neighborhood directly. It must either remain in this exit set or leave uh, this entire index pair. Afterwards, it can of course come back, uh, but it, it cannot come back directly from the exit set. Uh, this is why the notion of the exit set is so intuitive. This is the set through which the points exit, and the points that are there really exit uh, the set. Well, in some, uh, it may turn out that inside this exit set, there is still some invariant uh, set, but we don't worry about this. Uh, the, exit, the purpose of the exit set is to capture how the points exit this isolating uh, neighborhood. Uh, there are uh, certain theorems. Uh, there is a big theory that justifies the correctness of this definition. Uh, in particular, uh, if we define the Conley index, then this is the homology, the relative homology of this index pair. And there are theorems that say that uh, every isolated invariant set has some index pair. If we take two different index pairs, for the semi isolated invariant set, uh, then the Conley index will be equivalent or the same, isomorphic. And the most useful property is that if the Conley index uh, of some uh, index pair is non trivial, then this means that there exists a non empty invariant set inside the isolated neighborhood. And this is something that is uh, very important from the numerical point of view. Uh, we can construct an index pair uh, and compute its Conley index, and then we have a computer assisted proof that the invariant part is non empty, which might not be that easy to prove uh, in some, by using some other means. So, so I'm going to use this uh, feature a lot. Uh, let me show a few popular Conley indices uh, that appear in dynamical system often. Uh, for example, we could have some attractors like fixed points, periodic orbits. Uh, we could have some hyperbolic sets, uh, fixed points, periodic orbits again. Uh, there are also some trivial indices that appear near bifurcations where we cannot prove that the dynamics goes through some set. Uh, so it, it appears that the invariant part might be non empty. However, the Conley index is trivial. Which means that we cannot prove that it is really non empty. Yet it could be an empty part. Uh, if we have a set of fixed points, just like in the picture before, uh, then the, well, let's see what the Conley index looks like. Uh, we take the quotient space of this large set P1 and the other part of the pair is P2, and we take, uh, so, so it corresponds to topologically squeezing the exit set to a single point. We take a homotopy equivalent space, which will be just the circle with this specific point that uh, originates from the exit set. And the relative homology means that we don't count this connected component to which the point P belongs. Uh, so the homology is uh, zero uh, in terms of uh, counting connected components. Z is the first position, which corresponds to this. Uh, loop and then zeros elsewhere. And this kind of quotient space is called sigma one. This is uh, the very prominent uh, topological space that corresponds to a hyperbolic fixed point with one direction of uh, instability. And in higher dimensions, if uh, the dimension of the uh, Antelio manifold is one, uh, the picture looks precisely the same. Now, if there is an attracting fixed point, uh, here I am putting this for, for float. Then an isolating neighborhood could be this blue disk. There are no trajectories leaving this uh, neighborhood in forward time. So the exit set is empty. This is a good index pair. And now we take the quotient space and divide by the empty set, you know, no division by zero. Okay, so uh, instead of dividing by zero, we add an artificial extra point to the space, which is denoted by the asterisk. And 
we take this asterisk as this extra point uh, to which the exit set that did not exist was squeezed. Uh, so the homology of this, the relative homology of the space is uh, the Z. We have just one connected component, no loop. And this is a typical uh, situation when we have an attractor. Uh, we just get uh, some number of connected components that correspond to the number of connected components of the isolated neighborhood. And then uh, there is nothing more. Uh, well, except for the structure of this set. Uh, if we have a repelling fixed point, then uh, an index pair might look like this. We have a disk and the exit set is uh, the circle around the disk. Uh, we, call, we take the quotient space and this looks like the sphere with this extra uh, point to which the exit set was squeezed. Uh, so this is one connected component, but we don't count the connected components to which the exit set was squeezed. And the homology is 0, 0, and C at the uh, third position or, or uh, dimension two homology. Uh, let's see two more situations. If we have uh, an attracting periodic trajectory, then uh, P1 could be this uh, like a, a belt around this trajectory. All the trajectories enter uh, this neighborhood in forward time, so no trajectories exit. Uh, the exit set is empty. Again, we have the division by zero error, uh, so we have this extra point, and we get. Uh, the circle and this extra point that doesn't count for homology. So the homology is Z and Z. If we have a repelling, uh, an unstable periodic trajectory with uh, one dimension of instability, uh, then the exit set uh, could be something like the one that's plot in red here. Uh, so in relative homology, we get uh, no connected components because uh, the only connected component contains uh, this point P. And then we have uh, sort of the, the wedge of uh, the circle and the sphere. So let me take a moment to see why this works. If we squeeze this, uh, this in the middle to a single point, uh, then we squeeze the outer circle to another point, we connect these points, so we get the sphere with the extra uh, string inside, or, or we can put the string outside. Okay, so these are some typical conditions that we see in uh, actual dynamical systems. Now, we can also compute the same uh, invariant, the conic index for maps, except it gets slightly more technical. Suppose we have uh, this rectangle, rectangle the box, uh, that is uh, stretched in one direction and squeezed in another direction by the map. So its image might look like this, the, the green set. Again, we have essentially the same conditions uh, for the index pair, except now they are formulated in terms of a map, not a flow. So they look much simpler. Uh, An index pair might look like this. So we have uh, the, the blue part should be an isolated neighborhood. The red part is uh, the exit set, and we have the condition saying that uh, the image of the blue part does not exit. Well, it's contained in the union of the blue and red. The image of the red part does not intersect the, the blue part, so it might look like uh, the green. And uh, this isolation condition. And this generalization was made uh, by Andrew Shemchak in the 90s. And there were some other also equivalent uh, definitions for some specific cases uh, by Rosek and uh, some other mathematicians were involved. Uh, nevertheless, uh, these are the conditions for the index pair. And in addition to the relative homology of the index pair, we also need to consider the map induced on this index pair. Uh, thanks to the conditions for the index pair, we have the excision property, which essentially means. Uh, go back on slide, that the image of the green part does not touch the blue set. So this is this extra condition. And in this way, excuse me, the image of the uh, red part, which is marked in green, does not touch the blue part. 
it sometimes happens in natural computation, so we do another trick, but I'm not going to get uh, into the details. Uh, and then we can talk about uh, the map induced on the index first. So we get this mapping of the index first forward by one step, and then we can squeeze the green part back to the red set, to the exit set, uh, so that we get an endomorphism. Uh, I'm denoting it here in cohomology, but uh, in the finite setting, I'm going to do the computations. So Mouse and homology is uh, essentially equivalent. And this definition was given by Marian Rosek. He found out that in addition to considering the index map, uh, you also need to do uh, some quotient, uh, what he called the, uh, the red factor. Essentially, it means that you need to uh, take the quotient of this map by the generalized kernel because there might be some uh, non trivial homology that is mapped by the map into trivial uh, elements in homology, and you want to get rid of them. You only want to keep the part that becomes uh, that gets invariant under iterations of the map. Uh, okay, so this is just. Uh, Brief information about this fact. The important uh, thing is that in order to compute the corner index, it is not enough to compute relative homology of the index first. We also need to be able to compute the map induced homology, uh, which, from the computational point of view, is uh, a pain in the, or uh, an expensive thing. Okay. Uh, let's uh, have a look at some. Uh, popular coming this is like you have fixed points, uh, periodic orbits. Uh, now the map can either preserve the orientation or not preserve the orientation. We have different cases. Uh, for example, if we have an attracting fixed point, uh, I'm plotting like a continuous time dynamical system, but uh, uh, the dynamics is that the points are jumping. So if we have the green point here, its next iterate will be closer to the fixed point, then it will enter the isolating neighborhood, and with each iterate, it will get closer. Uh, if we have a map that is a time key map for some flow, so this is a uh, translation in some flow by some fixed time, then the index map will be the identity. And this is the theorem. Uh, so in this example, uh, it is no wonder that. We get the identity. Uh, the homology, relative homology of the index pair is Z because we have one connected component, this one doesn't count, and the map uh, maps this connected component to itself. So the index map is the identity. The generator number one in homology is mapped to generator number one to, to itself. And uh, now if we have a uh, saddle point, uh, then I think we can have uh, two different cases. If this is a map that comes from the flow, then it will preserve the orientation, of course. And we can get uh, also the identity uh, as the map in homology. Uh, on the other hand, if we have a map that reverses the orientation, so uh, you can think of uh, this rectangle being squeezed in one direction, actually stretched in one direction, squeezed in another, the and then flipped the other one. Uh, the other way. Uh, so this part of the exit set is mapped to this little part of the exit set. This part of the exit set is mapped to this part. Uh, and if a point like the green dots is approaching uh, the fixed point in the middle like, along this line, then everything goes like very nice. But if there is a point uh, that is leaving this neighborhood, uh, with each iterate, it gets mapped to the other side of this line. So we have sort of jumping back and forth. And this jumping or this uh, reflection in the space is mapped in, uh, is reflected in the map, in the map itself. So the homology of the index pair is the same as uh, in the continuous case, but the map uh, maps this generator into the negative generator. And here, uh, short remark, uh, for computational homology, people often take uh, the coefficients in Z2 for the computations to be faster, the representation 
to be the single bit uh, representations uh, much quicker. Uh, in that case, we would lose this information about uh, the orientation reversal. Uh, that's why I tried computing homology over Z. Uh, well, in fact, uh, computing over some finite field might also work. Like in Phi, you would see that the, the, the generator G1 would map to four times uh, G1, which clearly suggests uh, there is the orientation uh, uh, switch. Okay, now uh, there could be some periodic orbits, like a period of two, and then we have two connected components for uh, an isolated neighborhood. Uh, G1 is mapped to G2 and G2 is mapped to G1. Uh, the map, the, the matrix of the map in homology is like this. Uh, since uh, these isolated neighborhoods could have complicated structure, there could be some spurious isolated uh, Spurious components, we get some uh, sophisticated homology, which nevertheless uh, is mapped in a couple of iterations to zero. Uh, it is it is neat to compute the eigenvalues of this uh, map in homology. Uh, to have another, it's a weaker invariant, but it, uh, it is independent of uh, of the computation of the complications of this map. We will get straight to the Lerae function. If we have a period three orbit, for example, then we get the matrix like that. The diagonal values are uh, the uh, roots of uh, the unit. Uh, and we get this mapping of homology generators one into another. There could be some minus appearing uh, in pairs here, depending on uh, how the generators of homology were uh, chosen by the software. Okay, so this was sort of a lengthy introduction. And now let's uh, get down to the actual algorithms and computations. Uh, and it's high time that I eventually define the purpose of the method formally. Uh, so as an input, we take a parameter of a, a family of semi-dynamical systems, which has some parameters. Like uh, this could be a biological system which has uh, five different parameters. And what we need to know about uh, this system is first the formula for it, or at least some computational method to compute images of uh, points and boxes. Uh, we have some bounded rectangular region in Rn. This is the phase space, uh, some, some section of the phase space. Uh, we want to have it bounded uh, because we want to know the computations uh, in the computer, so we don't want an infinite number involved here. Uh, we have a bounded uh, interval for each interval range for each uh, parameter. So if you have m parameters, uh, you have a rectangular box uh, that contains all the possible parameters. And the output that we would like to get is uh, a database of dynamics uh, that appears in the system. Uh, we would like to have this dynamics uh, expressed in terms of uh, Cohen Morse graphs, uh, this kind of graphs that uh, show uh, the isolated environment sets, uh, the possible connections between them, and the Cohen indices of each of the sets. And from this database, we would like to be able to ask some questions like uh, get existence of invariant sets of certain types uh, we can ask for attractors or periodic uh, sets uh, we'd like to be able to identify parameters or collections of parameters for which the dynamics look the same and also detect possible bifurcations this is where the dynamics doesn't look the same and if we look at specific changes in the dynamics uh, we could infer uh, define that some bifurcations uh, Occur. Uh, we started this, well, this project was started earlier. Uh, we used even certain software and algorithms that I developed in my PhD thesis in 2001. Uh, our major paper is 2009, and then there were a few other papers with some generalizations uh, and additional uh, applications. Uh, let me now uh, say uh, some. Comparison to the classical method of analysis of dynamic systems. The classical methods are typically uh, either analytical and analytical methods where you 
analyze the equations. Uh, people usually can get uh, can solve the equations for equilibria, uh, compute their stability by linear notation. And finding periodic orbits is uh, a little tricky with this. Uh, there are a lot of numerical simulations uh, that can be done to dynamical systems. Uh, but then you essentially get stable sets. Uh, you iterate some trajectory in the simplest setting, you just iterate using the Ronde Kutta method or some other numerical method. And then the trajectories uh, that you start from different points in the space stabilize at some points, and then you get only a track. Uh, this method, uh, well, this method, uh, well, any kind of uh, qualitative uh, analysis of dynamical systems requires tremendous reduction of information. You don't want to have a database of all the trajectories in the space, because it will be difficult to search through. We want to get uh, some uh, limited, uh, small kind of information that still uh, retains uh, the important parts about the dynamics. Like the Collymore's graphs shows the major recurrent, uh, in fact, it shows all the recurrent dynamics uh, in the system, and possible connections between these sets. Uh, so here we can uh, find invariant sets that are not necessarily stationary points. So we can get periodic orbits or some more sophisticated uh, uh, invariant sets like invariant tori or periodic solutions. We also can get unstable solutions uh, for the set, uh, for the dynamics, uh, because in this method, we compute all the isolated invariant sets. Uh, and we also get information about connecting orbits uh, between them. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to show, uh, in fact, the computations are run and the algorithms work for uh, uh, dynamical systems with discrete time. But there are theorems uh, that say that if we take a time to map, uh, then essentially we get precisely uh, the correct information for the continuous time dynamical system if we analyze the time to map. Uh, in particular, uh, isolated invariant sets uh, that we compute are for the time to map are isolated invariant for the flow. The coding indices are the same. Uh, let me just briefly skip this. And the more decomposition that we obtain is also valid for uh, the flow. And now the computation that we do for uh, the time team up, uh, the idea is to discretize the phase space. We just uh, take a rectangular grid and we do computations for each uh, cube or hypercube or for each box of points in the phase space. So we do the computations collectively, not to iterate individual points, we iterate individual sets. And we use the CAPD software that is developed in Krakow. Uh, they this software contains uh, some interval arithmetic, uh, rigorous numerical integration of ODEs, uh, that is done with a, in a very efficient and effective way by taking uh, sets uh, with different coordinate systems, like parallel five bits, can be iterated further to minimize uh, some overestimates. So, suppose the image of a box looks like this dark gray set. Uh, we enclose this image in a uh, an inter a product of intervals. Uh, this is a rigorous computation. And then we cover this image by boxes. Uh, so we say that we have a multi valued map that maps each box into a collection of boxes. And this is a representation of a continuous map. And we represent this map in terms of a directed graph. Uh, each node of the graph corresponds to a box in the phase space. And each edge in the graph or directed arrow corresponds to uh, the mapping. Uh, it turns out that this simple representation uh, can be used to obtain all the information we need. So we run graph algorithms. In fact, we find strongly connected path components of the graph. Uh, this is a computer science part of uh, this project. A connected path, uh, a path component is a collection of, vert of nodes of vertices in the graph, so that from each node there is a path in the graph to this to another node and back maybe another path to this one. So all these nodes are connected by path going back and forth uh, in the graph. And it turns out that once we have computed these components, we actually computed isolating neighborhoods for the dynamical system. 
because this was a representation of the map. And even better, uh, we already have index pairs for uh, the map because if we take a combinatorial Morse set or this uh, uh, component, then we just take the forward image uh, for the exit set. For example, uh, so the definition of an index pair in the context of uh, in this combinatorial context of cubical boxes could be that, uh, well, we actually have two conditions only. Uh, the image of the blue part is contained in blue and red, so it could look like the green set. And the image of the exit set uh, could be like denoted in red here, does not intersect uh, the blue. Uh, it can touch it, but it does not intersect uh, in terms of cubes. And we don't have the condition about the isolation because we got it for free. Thanks to the fact that it was an uh, isolating, uh, it was a representation of this uh, continuous map. Now, the actual computation of the Conley index, uh, well, the, the relative homology of the index pair is not so uh, tough, but uh, computing the map is uh, quite time consuming. There were several papers on which uh, the algorithms are based. Uh, and to compute the eigenvalues, we just use the LAPAC the linear algebra package, uh, the standard uh, C software. Uh, now, Okay. Yes, now work. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the last uh, piece of this puzzle is once we have computed Conley Morse maps uh, for uh, all the parameter boxes, because here we also divide these, uh, these parameters, these huge param box of parameters, into smaller boxes. We do the computation in interval arithmetic. So instead of computing the dynamical system and integrating this in a rigorous way for an individual, a value of parameter, we just do the computations for intervals of parameters. And we still get uh, valid outer bounds. So suppose we have some computations for adjacent uh, parameter boxes. Now we compare the Conley Morse graphs. If we can find a one to one correspondence between the isolating neighborhoods, then we conclude that, uh, well, this is a, it can be mathematically proven that there is some sort of continuation uh, between these systems. Uh, in this way, we get uh, uh, an equivalence relation on uh, the parameter boxes. Uh, it would be ideal to do the computations for large parameter intervals in some regions of, of the phase space or of the space where uh, the computations are not so demanding and do some refinements in uh, some more demanding parameters. Uh, we don't do that yet, however, we do a gradual uh, subdivision in the phase space when we compute uh, the Morse decomposition. Uh, we refine the initial, initially very coarse uh, grid, and then we compute the invariant part, and we restrict our further computations just to the invariant part. Because uh, by doing these computations, we prove numerically, so this is a mathematical, mathematical uh, computer assisted proof that the, all the trajectories from outside this environment part actually leave uh, this part of phase space in forward or backward time. So we are not interested in these. And here's an example of some computation where we gradually find this already after four steps, most of the phase space uh, was thrown away. And this tremendously reduces the amount of computation that we actually do. Now, finally, uh, the results. What we would like to obtain is uh, <coughs> okay, uh, first uh, uh, an example system that we uh, analyzed uh, is a Leslie population, population model. It's a, a deep di dimensional dynamical system. Uh, this is a map, so it's a discrete time dynamical system with some linearity. And there are 2D parameters. What people were doing in the literature is fixing uh, 
everything except for one parameter, and for example, uh, computing uh, bifurcation diagram. Uh, what we would like to do is not fixing all the parameters, but just fixing some and analyzing the global dynamics with respect to all the other parameters varying in time. And the images that we obtain is sometimes then we call this continuation diagram. And this is the uh, box of the parameters uh, divided into classes of equivalent parameters. Uh, the results of these computations can, can be found on this web page. I put the address here. Uh, and also, this web page contains uh, soft, all the software uh, that we use uh, for uh, doing the computations and for visualizing the results. Uh, in fact, uh, just before the conference, there was a, a workshop on numerical uh, methods, uh, on computational, numeric, uh, computational mathematical methods, where I was uh, doing a live demo of downloading the software, compiling, running computations, and after a few minor changes in the code, it works. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me show uh, what we can get from this kind of diagram. For example, we can uh, look at these classes of parameters and see how they are connected. And here, uh, I don't know how uh, informative this kind of diagram is, but anyway, you can get all the adjacent uh, <coughs> classes Connections and possible bifurcations are, are just parts in this diagram. If you look at different parameter boxes, for example, if you follow this way, you can see some bifurcations. Like we have a period two attractor, uh, which we can recognize by the common index, but this is an attractor. And there is a settle, uh, I mean, this is an isolating neighborhood that looks like an isolating neighborhood of a settle fixed point. Uh, there is no proof that there exists a certain fixed point inside. If you want to prove this, then you must use some uh, numerical methods that involve the derivatives. This is a topological method. So you get uh, topological properties, uh, and the results are valid for all the classes of maps, continuous maps, uh, that for, for which this representation, uh, the box to box map, uh, is valid. Uh, then we get uh, some bifurcations like undoing the period W bifurcation. Uh, there is a period three uh, orbit that it's uh, common index is trivial, but after you move a little bit with the parameters, it splits into a fixed uh, period three attractor and the period three uh, saddle. So this is a saddle node bifurcation except that period three. Uh, well, by the way, this situation is quite interesting because you've got two attractors, and this contradicts the commonly held belief among some biologists who say that it doesn't matter what the initial conditions of the biologic system, the system are, uh, the situation will stabilize eventually. Now we have computer assisted proof of the fact that there could be two different kinds of stabilization. Uh, and then some more. Uh, bifurcations. Uh, in some cases, uh, the isolated the isolated neighborhood is quite large. And in this method, we don't get any insight uh, into the dynamics of uh, that is inside this isolated neighborhood. This is uh, an ongoing project uh, that we do at Dynes University of Technology uh, with Justyna and uh, Gregor Graf uh, uh, to, to get some uh, computational graph-based methods for the analysis of the dynamics inside uh, these isolating uh, neighborhoods. Now, what the best we can do is to compute the common index and to get some information from the outside uh, to see what might be inside. Uh, since my time is almost over, uh, let me just uh, show one more application. Uh, so th there were some applications with physicists. Uh, there was a three-dimensional system of ODEs that models uh, plasma. And it is uh, important to know the phase transitions in plasma uh, in order to eventually build the hydrogen power plant. But uh, it will take some time. And 
using uh, this method, we found uh, some regions of parameters where there are some limit cycles. And we check this from the topological point of view that these are cycles, not just large isolated neighborhoods. And something that is uh, important nowadays, we also apply this to some uh, model in epidemiology. Uh, this was uh, this is a collaboration with uh, some co-authors in uh, Hungary. Uh, there was a four-dimensional ODE, pretty realistic for uh, modeling uh, two cities connected by transportation. And there were a lot of different parameters uh, included in the model, like the vaccination rate, the degree of susceptibility, susceptibility reduction, and things like that. And the interesting thing that we found uh, was that with even small changes in the parameter, the dynamics can vary drastically. And in some cases, that there are up to four different attractors, uh, which confirms, uh, but sort of justifies why those uh, predictions for the development of uh, the epidemic were so wrong at times. Uh, well, this is because the system itself is, the models uh, already are very sophisticated and. There are a lot of uncertainties uh, in the model. Uh, eventually, let me point out the fact that this is sort of an interdisciplinary research. As, as you saw, it involves uh, dynamical systems, computational algebraic topology, so some algorithms, rigorous numerics, graph algorithms, and scientific computing. Because well, I didn't say how costly these computations were, but they took several hours on the computer faster. Uh, it's not that computing. Uh, so many common indices uh, can be done on it. Uh, and this is, in fact, also a cross disciplinary research. Uh, you get some post potential applications in population biology, theoretical physics, epidemiology, and wherever you use dynamical systems for modeling. Uh, that's all our, I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, we have questions or comments. Yeah, so, uh, I found the visualization when we are using dynamic statistics more for a slow analysis. So, I think it's synthetic, but one of the basic assumptions is that your system is not time to time, right. which is often not the case. So, so That's right. what do you think we can do? You can model time for a bridge of Carolina, um, or would you need a completely different definition of uh, it's a very intense? So, well, I think that with time dependence, uh, this breaks everything here. Uh, you get uh, sort of an infinite dimensional system if you want to model this correctly. Uh, so, unfortunately, this doesn't work. Uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, the modifications would be much deeper than I can handle. And uh, you think well, if you take the time as the parameter, then you get a fixed a dynamical system. And then you can see how the dynamical system itself varies when you vary this parameter. But I think you, get, you will get a different kind of results. And I, I'm not sure how, how this would relate to the fact that the time can change while the, 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 the dynamic or the parameter can change while we continue with the dynamics. Here, using the graph algorithm, uh, you look at this entire phase space and the entire region range of time at the same time, at one per swoop. And if the system varies in time, then the graph would change in time also. And so this would require a completely different approach. I think. I yeah, I can hear it. So I'm curious, you can scale up the parameter expectation to higher dimensions than two. But you, on the features, you have like... Uh, sure. Uh, so can you, can you do like a two-dimensional graph, maybe? Also uh, yes, uh, the computational complexity increases exponentially with the dimension, but the theory and the software in principle can work in any finite dimension in the phase space and in the parameter space. So for example, in this model, we did uh, computations in four dimensional phase space. 
and this was for an ODE, so it involved integration, a rigorous integration, uh, but CAPD library performs just uh, amazing in this case. And for the parameters, uh, you can do the computations for three parameters varying in some ranges, but then there's some problem with visualization of this. Uh, I think I, I can show, we actually did computations of the Leslie model for three parameters varying. Uh, let me try and uh, launch the web page. Uh, here I've got the link. <laughs> Let's go here. Okay, you can't see this again. I need some technical help. Unfortunately, uh, it's just uh, several browsers. Okay, so this is the diagram. It is interactive, so you can click each parameter and see the uh, Conimos graph and the phase space. Uh, you can easily see the phase space because it's two dimensional. For high dimensions, uh, uh, you, the purpose of the software is that you don't need to visualize this to see the dynamics, uh, but instead compute the invariance and to infer the dynamical properties from the graphs. And here is uh, an illustration of the three-dimensional computations. So we computed uh, 40 layers or 50 by 50 uh, parameters. And then when you move in the three-dimensional space of parameters, then some regions of parameter that were separate in two dimensional picture now turn out to join to be joined in the higher dimensions. Uh, so here you can see, for example, the black region of parameters. Uh, it is painted in black. For some, uh, in some slices, uh, it consists of a few connected components. But then you see through the animation that these components actually merge at different points. So this shows that uh, these uh, the dynamics for these parameter uh, boxes uh, are equivalent. It is also possible to visualize the parameter sets. I don't know how well you can see the structure. So this is a visualization of a set of parameters that was painted in black. It consists of 80,000 boxes and a sample uh, Conimor's graph and uh, face space look like this. Uh, you can do the same for another parameter box. Uh, for example, the blue region has this kind of structure in R3. Okay. Uh, so it was the computations were done a couple of years ago and it took maybe like 100 hours of 20 years working together. Well, if you have access to a good computer cluster, I have in Gdansk, there is a task computer cluster, which is on the list of the fastest 500 computers in the world. So it's only a matter of uh, how much, uh, how long I want to wait uh, to get uh, the, the nodes assigned and then to have the result completed. Uh, a little problem though is with the memory uh, because even if uh, those computer clusters, the memory is typically uh, bound by like two gigs or four gigs per process. And each process computes the common index uh, the computation of the index map is uh, the most time consuming and memory consuming. So this is the, the main technical uh, limitation of this method, which also shows that there's uh, still need for, for the improvement in uh, this field. Okay, any other questions? Not that it's time travel again. <laughs> Thank you.
and we now have a coffee break until 11.30. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Okay, we have a couple of other things, right? Yeah, I'll screen. Uh, announcement number one is uh, tomorrow we have an excursion to Bosnia. 